Welcome to my new order, Don't Surf. Let's play as the Reich's Commissariat Us Africa. We are playing as the most evil of the three uh, Reich's Commissariats that are playable in the new order. Because uh, once the full version of this mod comes out, I want to play as America being the good guys. So for now, we're going to be playing the complete opposite. So, uh, let's see, the research... This entire thing is obviously now different from the base game, so I don't know what's best. Let's see. We already have a bunch researched. Let's go for... Let's see, 1960, you can get some research there. For industry, we already started going down vertical, so we'll go... See all ahead of time, ahead of time. What do we need? We need steel and aluminum. We don't have that much rubber, so we can go for guess more rubber from there. As tanks go, get the next level. Oh no, that that main battle tanks way ahead of time. Let's do maneuver. I actually maybe with attrition attrition planning because of the location in the world we are. Free dockyards. Go for a con. Just go all convoys. No national focus we're going with. The Guardians of Africa. <sighs> okay. The Afri Africa is a nest of vipers. It is a land infested by bandits, overrun by rebels, endangered by terrorists, and even worse, full of traitors. It is clear by the day that among the four Reich Reichskommissariaten, we are the only ones actually defending the interests of Germania and the Dark Continent, and ensuring that the light of national socialism still shines even in the pitch black jungles covering this hellhole. We are the last we are the guardians of Africa and we will ensure our legacy lasts for a thousand years. No one else can be trusted. No one. Focal Power Hundred and get the event the Guardian of Africa. Go just go ahead and go max speed and press play. Only have four Can I even build I'm building some buildings, yeah. We have a lot of open slots, but literally no economy to build from. Construction speed is super down. Um, so we've got a super large event. It's, let's see, the Reich's Last Conquest. We won the space race. Uh, Assuming that's one of these, surrounded by degeneracy. I don't know how we get rid of that. Alright, but Guardians of Africa is almost done. Hitler names Heydrich his successor. Following the recent events. Oh, let's see. Actually, we'll skip through stuff that's not directly related to Africa to keep stuff going. The Guardian of Africa, shimmering in the torpid heat of the afternoon, the sun casts its golden rays across the deep emerald guardian gardens. Long shadows followed down the white fell pathways, where every so often a gardener could be glimpsed drifting through the gloom. It was the time of the afternoon where men grew weary as the hours stretched on, awaiting the evening coolness that heralded the workday's end. In stark contrast to the slaves meandering through his umbrella guardians, Reich's commissariat Hans Hutig stood at attention, his spine as straight as the marble pillars that flanked him. From the shade of his palace balcony, he frowned due down at the gardeners with the stays. Ignoring the sweat that soaked through his heavy woolen uniform, Hutig raised his mug to his lips and sipped, savoring the bitter taste of his afternoon coffee, determined to preserve the purity of his Arianism. It was one of the few luxuries he allowed himself. Finishing his coffee, Hutig returned to his office. A phalanx of revolving fans cooled the air, battering it around the room. A stark contrast to his sweltering Moise of Africa, 
it brought to mind nostalgic images of days spent in the wintry, wintry Saxony of his boyhood. Wiping such pointless thoughts from his mind with determined efficiency, Hudig sat back, sat behind his enormous mahogany desk and continued his paperwork. As he drafted yet another letter to Germania requesting more aid than supplies, Hutig briefly wondered how Mueller and Schneck were occupying the afternoon. He conjured the mental image of Mueller pissing himself in a drunken stupor and Schneck's desk collapsing under the weight of unread reports. Neither of those indolent fields were fit to bear the title Reich's Commissar. Only he had the will, the strength, the purity to advance the Reich's interests in Africa. Smirking, he signed the letter and dumped it in the outtray, snatched another document off the pile. Dick found as he read it was a dossier detailing the results of an investigation to the past of a recently constructed bridge in San Bia, which was blamed on poor planning by the German engineers in charge of the project. In a sudden fit of pick, he crumbled it into a ball and threw it into the wastebasket. Scowling, he took leaned back, the creaking of his chair setting him on the edge. Always he's surrounded by idiots and confidence. How was he supposed to impose aerialities in Africa when the dregs? I don't think I'm. Okay, there we go, I'm not going to read it all. Where was I? So I'll fit. He started by any incompetence. How was he supposed to impose the Aryan idea in Africa when the dregs were all he ever got? The Craven Fools, the Bunglers, the Exiles, and the Reichs all fit to dump in his lap. Runia seemed to think the Quaglomane as a refuse pile fit only for the inadequate to serve in the Reich proper. But what, asked a little voice in the back of his head, did that make him? For a moment, he takes that idle, doing nothing but listening to the fans until their steady thrumming seemed indistinguishable from the beat eating of his heart. Then, sliding through his nose, the Reich's Commissar bent forward to fish the uncovered dossier out of the wave basket. He ate all this and he somehow couldn't get away. Let's see, we can do stability or we can do the drums echo. Let's see, let's try to get some stability up. Uh, clean the colony. Colony is rife with Senate slaves who don't accept their places at the bottom of the racial pyramid, tolerated natives who still fight for freedom, even Aryans are own blood asking for reforms, all we can ask from within when we should be at our strongest. It's time to crush these pathetic dissidents and remind everyone not only their place, but also that the Aryans that destiny to dominate Africa forever. A concerted effort shall be undertaken from all offices of the colonial government or to utterly destroy those who still haven't vanquished in our earlier attempts. Honestly, I I don't really 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 get this. You know, you can't even build civilian factories. Your country's falling apart, and I mean, your reaction is to look around and be like, "Yeah, all the other governors are horrible at their job." I don't get it. Let's see, maybe, maybe we can fix this somehow. I don't know everything we can do in this uh, this political uh, tree. I'm gonna stay evil. But maybe we can at least have a functioning government, somewhat. Maybe. I don't know. Clean the colony once that's done. Which one do we want to go? No division of basic training. Yeah, well, we should definitely be using these guys. And I'm sorry if you can hear that dog in the background, but that's my neighbor's nothing I can really do about it. Okay, let's start with. Africa ado, ado, they're Italians. The last thing the Wush had expected was two white people unarmed wandering into the village in the thick of the bush. After managing to capture the village from Hutic troops, the black rebels had bunkered down, repelling any enemy scout that came too close, but none of them had been brave or foolish like these two. They fell right into the hands of rebel patrol. Screaming and pleading for mercy, they were dragged into the main square to be lined up against the wall, and much to the amusement of the Wush had never stopped taking film even in their final moments. The leader of the militia, a massive black man wearing a pair of German military sunglasses alongside a similarly improvised uniform, wanted to execute the two German scouts in person. Please, for God's sakes, we're not Germans, one shouted as the other kept filming, despite numerous hands trying to grab his camera and his guys were shooting a movie, a movie. Quickly, he produced documents from his pocket. Regino di Italia said the letters on the exterior. The rebel leader squinted, struggling to read the document. Jacob Petit, a few months later, the rebel leader, whose nom de guerre was Simba, was 
Freddy and two Italians, no longer in Cheerios, but as welcome guests. With a smile on his face, he showed the two around the village, especially the places where fighting had happened, and where the grim remnants of fallen Grimmel Garrisons had their collaborators laid to rot, or people be free. Symbol came before the camera with a wide smile, gesturing towards the pale skull of a German soldier still wearing this double helm. Now serving as a decoration for the village's main interest, all of Africa will be free one day. That evening, Jacob Petit talked with a few of them as men, all farmers, simple people, driven to rebellion by desperation. As they sped towards the sudwest African border on a looted German jeep, Simba was kind enough to compensate with a ride the two Italians, who would soon co-sign him and his men to the fame they deserved. Sudis Africa beckons. The meeting of General Bro. Hattic always found it amusing to call a meeting of General Bro to take place in a few hours, forcing his subordinates to scurry from their villas to his places, but not to be the last to arrive. While I was trying their best to look unflappable, his underlings had arrived by helicopter and chauffeuring sedan or seated in the palace's enormous conference room. The meeting was with was not without purpose, always feeling the knife hovering behind his back, Hutic had been, been suspicious of anti national social tendencies among his officers. Eyes narrowed and they looked around the table, glancing at each man in turn, noting who flinched and who, more importantly, who didn't. Could anyone on the general board have spurious sympathies to anyone but Hutig? That would be unthinkable. Eyeing his general, she made the mental note to have them put under even more thorough surveillance. Men, he began as the last servant left the room. We live in precarious times. It will be brief. From the outside, we are threatened by degenerates and Judeo capitalists. From within, on the borders of the right common side, we are troubled by rebels, escape slaves, and so-called revolutionaries. Though we may expect that the racial purity of our men will lead us to victory, triumph is not assured. To prevail against the threats that face us, we must root out the cancer of the heart of Ost Africa. He paused, looking around at his men, hoping for reaction. Barr, looking nervous, always afraid of being replaced as the favorite DuPont, gray face as usual. Shamil Whiskey and Miguel staring back at him with their dead eyes stifling him in the white side. To continue, we cannot fight the barbarians when our own men are tainted by saying our reformism. It is impaired that we root up the liberals in our ranks like weeds. They are not fit to serve the Reich, not even fit to call themselves Aryan. You will cooperate with my intelligence operators in identifying the quotidian chairs. We cannot allow these subversives to undermine national social. The conference continued, who took laid out plans to eradicate the subversives all, while feeling the spectral knife drawn closer and closer to his flesh. He had to scour the taint of treacherous thought from Ost Africa without mercy, without quarter, before it was too late. So, with that done, we can do. Let's do Ring of Fire. It is clear that Ost Africa. It's like a beast surrounded by fire. All around us, enemies lurk in the shadows, trying to take advantage of our numerical inferiority like a swarm of bees bringing down a bear. Even our so called allies can't be trusted. We need to increase the alert and tie to us all those who would perish alongside us and the majority of our defeat. Increasing our support among the superior races as much as possible. The fate of the Afrikaner Aryans depends on it. More command power, more war support. We really need that war support because right now we are negative. All right, our we are down on pretty much everything. Get everything we produced a bit more. This guy's useless, oh my god. Can't even replace him, okay. Keep an eye out for that. Bring the fire. Done. Get more some stability over here. Go with the drums echoes, because I think we might be able to get some more adventures. The indolent bastards who should be our brothers are content do it just doing nothing. Yor spends his time hunting beasts he shares so much with, especially in the brain department. While Schnick, the traitor, sh showers the inferiors in time and money, we could surely be find a more productive use too, but we are different. Yes, we are different. We have keen eyes and ears, and we know 
We see the dust rising in the south where a nation lies broken and ready class, and we hear the drums of war, the same drums who led our glorious hero to begin his crusade against imperialism. We shall follow his shining example as the drums of war and make them louder, louder, louder. Here, real quick. So. So, sorry, this. This was the guy who is hunting, I guess, and this guy's the trader. I don't know what, they're, what they did, but let's go ahead and as the clock chimed midnight, who takes ours awake? Almost falling off his chair, his eyes painfully adjusted to the harsh white light still set for his evening paperwork, filling his stomach shift turbulently as he stood. He barely stumbled to the Dimer to duel the lights, something back to his chair here to tell himself that overwork a bed to him falling asleep at his desk obviously had nothing to do with the cognac he had been drinking since breakfast. Temple thumping, he looked over his desk trying to remember what he had been doing before he dozed off. It all came back to him in a sudden flash of incandescent fury. After dinner, he received a telegram from Germani insisting that he uh, cease sending critiques of his fellow work on Arius. The pseudo degenerates in their plush met offices at Thornton, suggesting his constant criticism of those incompetent buffoons was tantamount to treason. Handshaking with rage, he took a glass up to the brim with cognac just to calm his nerves. How dare they suggest that? Donning his cognac, relishing his bit its bitterness, he took felt the fire of hatred go in his belly. Not only could he not trust Germania, but he was surrounded by enemies, each wanting to sink their knife in his back. The treasonous bastards and the other right common it's the traitors bowers wanting waiting for the opportunity to slip free from the Reich. The slippery Italians up north. It was like being surrounded by a ring of fire. The flames advancing, always advancing, until the day they see their flesh from his bones. He could not allow the generous and the traitors to prevail. Hutig leaned back slightly and immediately felt the horrific bone shattering creak in his chair stab into his brain like a million wicked needles. The blood rising to his face, something inside him finally snapped. Slowly he watched himself rise grab the chair and drag it outside the balcony into the bracing night air, hauling it onto the marble pub who to use what remained of his strength shoved the enormous leather chair off the edge. Staring into the lush blackness of his guardians who took heard the chair shatter on the gravel boil, playing from side to side, he lurched back inside and passed out on the office floor. Okay, once we get this more war support, should start to help us. But more importantly, I want to see this war decisions. Maybe we can get some more free factories and actually be able to produce something. Eighty-seven percent. We need to get consumer goods factories done. That's what we need. What does that do? Eight fifty percent construction speed. Eighty percent war support. Okay, Hans Hutick rose as he always did at the stroke of 5 o'clock following his rigorous morning exercise and a simple disrespect for fists of porridge and fruit. He donned his freshly pressed uniform and flung open the doors to his office where he'd work until the moon shone bright in the night sky. After turning on the many fans scattered around the room, Hutick strode to his desk as he sat, heard the horrible creak from the chair that made the teeth rattle on the simple wall scowling. His morning already thrown into disarray, he made a mental note to have the slave who had failed and the oh simple task of fisting the chair flogged. Taking a deep breath, Hutig centered himself, ignoring the pulsing headache he was already beginning to develop. He enthroned a map of Sub-Saharan Africa. Taking his pen, began to circle settlements and military installations on the border with South Africa. Reich's common saw Hutig did not think himself a fool. He knew the fragile peace between the Reich's colonies and South Africa was tenuous at best. Though supposedly determined to maintain the neutrality, South Africa's Anglo-Saxon government found itself racked by internal tensions caused by rebellious followers and natives which they were unable to resolve as a consequence of their pathetic degeneracy. South African government increasingly maintained its precarious clutch on the nation thanks to aid from the OFN, who was busily digging their claws into a allegedly neutral country. The OFN and the line South Africa was an unacceptable threat to the right interest in Africa. Hutik began to draw arrows towards Petersburg and Millsprit 
This fragile piece would not last much longer than the war game. He'd be ready. Okay, so we're going to need uh, these, All right? Southern land grants. Let's see, what do I want? I want more stability and more more support. Ooh, I need to get this. I need to reach out the border. Where do I get there? Right here. So I need. Help me to help you. There we go. Hey, I need to read it real quick. Our boar friends are fighting just like us against the remnants of the decadent imperialist nations. While poorer than the average South African, they show the typical Aryan bravery that made us win the last war. And we should ensure they are compensated for that. As a reward for efforts, we shall institute the Dutra Rhodesian Balfons, a bond program to help develop the Rhodesian land that will leave to our Renoist allies after the war. Surely they'll be grateful for that and they'll begin a long and fruitful cooperation. Almost done. The collapse of the triumphant. That is the uh, anti German attack. Here, we'll booby trap the border. So these guys kind of fell apart, and Germany's gonna be in a much stronger place. Um, booby trap the border. I gotta read this real quick. The war looming any closer, we need to actively prepare for the worst. For the other right common sars, consars, it feels an insult to the office who take represents to even call them as such. I've done nothing. We are prepared. In order to slowly advance until we can fully mobilize our scattered forces and inflict as many losses to enemy without any on our part, we shall disseminate the border with dozens of large minefields, wire trap guns, bridges, and railroads, and we might use against us. If the border effectively will be trapped. The OFN will think twice before entering our realm. Oh, the surprises we have in store for them. The Deutsche Rhodesian Bothounds. Shielding his eyes from the harsh morning sun, James Cumberdale squinted down the driveway at the cloud of dust driving in the wake of his family's Volkswagen as his wife took Godfrey to score, sorry, Godfrey to school in Fort Victoria. Sipping tea to the balcony of the plantation estate that had been his father's and his father's before him, James enjoyed the warmth of the rising sun, loosening his rheumatic joints as he gazed over the fields of the... I'm sorry. I'm... I'm going to pause from now on. I'll pause whenever stuff shows up on screen. We're in the desert. So who are you at war with? It doesn't say. Yeah, these guys are stronger than us. Maybe we can form a faction with the other ones. We reach out the border done. Passive defense schemes. Rex Commissar sat on the balcony of his palace, watching the slaves meandering through his still timber timberous gardens as the freshness of twilight chilled the sweat, moistening his heavy wool and uniform. Taking a moment to look up from the map sprawled over the table, he felt a thrill of quiet accomplishment run through him as he gazed on the order of the design, soon all of Africa would be would be remade in his image, ordered, disciplined, efficient, everything had, and everyone had their proper place. But until the dawn of that golden future, there was work to be done. Tearing himself away from the view, he took focus his attention back to the pile of maps, already darkening as the light faded. He would have to have to order a slave to bring him a lantern who's enjoying the evening, certainly too much to return to his office. With a single ivory finger, he traced the border between East Africa and South Africa, bore that w that when his perfectly laid out plans would come uh, fruition would soon cease to exist. Nevertheless, although his troops were better disciplined trained and equipped in South Africa's rabble, he was not full enough to think of victory, certainly, until the flag of the Reich was raised over Cape Town. Until then, it devised a contingency after contingency, should the unthinkable come to pass and the enemy push to East Africa. In, in case that 
Ludricrous possibility came to pass. He ordered the entire border mined and riddled with traps to cut down the advancing forces of the enemy. Now, he was left open for the generics to enter Aust Aust Africa unscathed. With their forces getting blown apart like sausages in a pain for every step they took, their forces would get sufficient so sufficiently for him to extract soldiers, tra sorry, crack troops to crush their advance and push them to the sea. Hutik turned his head to look into the distant, dusky horizon. Any day now the giants and subhumans could come. He could almost see the Saman horde cresting over the hills. When they came, they'd find him waiting for them. Brazil wins. Let's go with arms for Aryans. And we are going to test the gas. Alright, cool. So we can lay traps. Let's see, that has brought consumer goods down to 20. Let's see what happens once this is over. Maybe they'll bring it down even more. Let's go with building a stockpile. Training, clicking a switch, Jojo or Sergeant killed the lights for a moment. The only sound was where the ceiling fan whipping the fetid tropical air around the room and gathering Soldiers shifting in their seats. Another flick, the whirling of a film projector, an image appearing on the wall accompanied by bolsterous music. Africa, your duty. The title card cut to a montage of shots of natives starving, loitering, training with shoddy weapons. Invariably, they were shot at a distance from behind, because the African subhumans became an authoritative voiceover, seen in their natural state of verity to a German. The depravity of native Africans. May be shocking, even unbelievable, before the arrival of the area into Africa, the suddenly known as slain existence in the state of animals like savage or lower than all the Indians or the the Jew. Shots of mud huts, sparse fields, men with spears. The film abruptly cut to a classic low angle shot of blonde haired German soldiers, lines of tanks rolling down the streets of climbing, rippling flags, and so on. It was savagely amateur imitation of the Reich, Reich and Soul style, but the message was clear. You are part of the Aryan vanguard, the four spring civilization, and the by his national socialism to the untamed towards of Africa. We will civilize this land, we will cleanse the taint of genocide and dictance from his people, as the subhumans will often not accept the rightful place of purifying the order, as your duty to enforce the edicts of rights in these our newest and wildest territories. Lots of Germans with machetes cutting through the jungle, launching Mars. You are trailblazers entrusted with carrying forth the sacred flame of Aryanism, and so it continued on and on, in much the same vein. For two flowers, Sultan says, with trying not to appear bored in front of the drill sergeant, Stared wrapped at the flickering image. The last film in the projector clamp, which was stopped pointing the room once and more into darkness. Alright, um, so that's. We've actually ran out of time for this episode. So, But we have started to see the mind of our uh, not so glorious leader. Uh, we'll have more of them in the next episode. And I'll see you then.